Okay, we're back here at um, Forecast 2012 Intel sponsored event. I'm John Furrier, Silicon Angle. This is Cube Conversations with Jonathan Moore Mile from HP. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Cube Conversations. Uh, the discussion here is about the Data Center Alliance, uh, Open Data Center Alliance, Cloud Computing, Cloud Expo mm -hmm. here in New York City. One of the hottest topics that nobody's talking about <laughs> is you know, power and cooling and space in the data center. It's that thing that everyone kind of wants in the spirit of innovation. You know, rah, rah, go cloud, go big data. But at the end of the day, they got to stare at the data center and look at the fact that there's no footprint available. Mm -hmm. And that's a scarce resource. Absolutely. So you're in this business. So give us the update. Obviously, it's, well, it's talked about. I'm just kind of being kind of cynical about it. But the point is, is that it's an important conversation. Absolutely. And sure. um, space for creating more scale is critical. So Absolutely. give us an update on where that is in this conversation in the data center. Well, and it's 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 space to create more capacity, but it's got to be done smartly, right? I mean, because obviously with you know with densification going on and people needing that densification needing to be elastic, um, whether it's from a capacity perspective or a financial aspect of it, um, it's it's how do you do that? How do you do it relevant to your organization and the IT that goes with it? And then how do you marry that the blending of the IT and the facilities? And how do you do that in a smart way, right? Um, and so I think what we're seeing is a, a lot of obviously is the is the strategy of modular data centers, right? Whether that's going with an, an external strategy of a container or something like that or going down to the rack level from a modularity perspective deploying the optimized uh, infrastructure to go with that IT and doing it in a smart way um, and, and looking at it from a TCO perspective right not just a capex mm -hmm. not just an opex but overall how does it make me more efficient to deploy to manage um, and to into scale so one of the things that we're tracking on silicon angle um, is uh, and we haven't been publishing about it because it's kind of in the research phase is um, Set tier two cities for data centers is, is, a, is a big trend that's on people's radars, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we can put data centers in other cities that aren't, quote, tier one cities. Sure. They might have acceptable power, but not the best power situation, but power. Right. Um, that requires a different approach to the data center. You guys have been successful with HP Pods, right? right? Which sure. has been, you know, well documented. It's a beautiful product. But that's a full turnkey. Absolutely. So that's one, one interest. So talk about this one, this tier two data center, this need to expand, and the benefits of having modularity. And describe what modularity means. Is it space and product? Is it both? What kind of products can someone get in with modularity? Sure. So um, you know, when I talk about modularity, it's more of a it's more of a thought process and a concept, which represents not only uh, you know products deployment as well as services too. I think, and, and and not only is it the you know the purchasing and acquisition of it, but it's also the operations and maintenance perspective of that as well. And so with HP, of course, we've got a, a full line of products, it, whether it's at the facilities level with our flexible data center, all the way down to the rack level with mm -hmm. our modular cooling system or something like that. You know, that's something that we obviously believe in. And when you start start talking about going into you know uh, tier two it's markets, a, it's a space issue though. From one the, on one hand. The concern is, is a, there's no space. Correct. Any more space. Right. Right. So parking lot. There's some free capable parking spots and every for the every pod. area. Right. I mean, how can we convert an old warehouse? How can we convert um, you know an old classroom into something that's uh, you know that's easy to use, right? But doesn't require a heck of a lot of um, first cost investment. And you know, how can we repurpose it? And how can it be flexible in the future to be able to reconfigure it, repurpose it? And, and use it for what customers need, whether it be to shut off the entire yeah. room or, or to. So that's to one definition of modularity. Great. So right. talk about this tier two concept, tier two cities. And because with modularity, you can essentially leverage these new environments, whether it's a parking lot or a tier two city. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think what we're seeing too from an infrastructure perspective is that. Um, you know, a lot of the typical redundancy, you know, dual power paths and, you know, uh, two end cooling and all these different things and it's, everything's got to be kept at 70 degrees and, you know, a lot of those concepts are being challenged and a lot of them are starting to prove out that you don't necessarily need that. But of course, the enterprise space is always going to want availability, right? So they're like, you know, yeah. burn unicorns if I have to, but keep my IT up and up and running, right? Where mm -hmm. it, it affects scale out companies a lot more than that because obviously they're deploying tens of thousands of servers and doing it at, at a clip, right? And so what we're starting to see is through the redundancy in software and things like that, the actual infrastructure needs in certain market segments are reduced quite a bit. So you're able to go into uh, tier two cities and cities that may, the infrastructure may not be your areas, that the infrastructure may not be as robust as you know, customers may have uh, may not have chosen, or may, you know, maybe they've chosen a different location maybe 10 years ago, where today they're like, you know what, it's, it's connected, there's connectivity there, 
there's decent power and, and the price of real estate is cheap. And then they use their redundancy through replication and different things okay. like that. So it's a price issue, but also from a footprint standpoint, they just look at the costs. Absolutely. Go build out from scratch and tier one, it costs X. But when it's tier two with modularity and these elements, they get the same value, same uptime, same SLA, right, for the same price. Absolutely, cool. and then you know when you start looking at providers that can provide the entire package, right? It's how do we make it easy to deploy? How can we take this entire package and if we need to move it somewhere? And I'm talking about whether it's a a, a pod or a row of racks or something like that. How can we easily deploy it? And how can we deploy that integrated solution? And just if we need to pick it up and move it, or if we need to put it anywhere, location becomes almost. Not a dependency. Okay, right? so HP is well known on the pod side, turnkey, mm -hmm. high end. It's great demo, it's a great demo, and a great product. Um, but the thing that we're hearing from customers, in particular, is they need more customization. So it's almost the prefab version. Sure. You got to wrap it around this this column. I have this kind of space, so that maybe there's some customization required. Right. What's happening relative to that? What What's the level of turnkey that gives the customer a maximum set of uh, customization? What do you guys have? Is it like a portable, I'm thinking portable classroom, okay, kindergarten's too big, we got to add another classroom. Right, and you know, actually yeah. we're doing that in India. We're, we're actually, we actually deployed some portable labs and some portable classrooms in containers, believe it or not. Um, but what we're noticing is, it's really the, the base, the common modular architecture of a, of a base platform. And you, you reduce it down to the lowest element um, so that you give the customer choices and flexibility so that when you deploy the IT and the wrapper around it, which would be the facilities and the, and the infrastructure, that you are allowing some level of customization and optimization to the IT that they're deploying and of course making it relevant for the customer. So what we do is we understand at HP that customers are going to require that um, and so we leave the hooks in for yeah. other other customized options. And they could go with non-HP gear, obviously. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we it's understand not a, a lock-in from HP standpoint. Uh, heterogeneity is, is definitely um, is definitely something that um, we can't we're never going to get away from, and we're happy to even at our own factory integrate uh, you know third-party gear and things like that into some of our solutions and ship them out for our customers. So last night at dinner, I was talking in front of uh, all the Intel executives, doing my normal you know, controversial statements, and I said, <laughs> green is bullshit in the data center. <laughs> True or false? You um, got to say false, because you work for HP. In the data center, you yes. Uh, you know, we, we, we love power, right? Um, we love power, well, <laughs> no, on the infrastructure it, side, I love, to, you know, I love using and cooling. Buyers uh, aren't, aren't, I mean, I'm over, you know, creating some controversy, but the reality is, is that the buyers we talk to, and the environments we talk to, green is not on the top of the list. You're absolutely right, and you're so going to see that in, in your you know in your enterprise space. You're going to see it in you know in Fed and things like that. They'll try to get there, but on new construction is a different ball game. You have absolutely to, construction has some compliance green issues. They got to put put bike racks maybe available and other things. Sure. But really, what, where are we with the, with the green, both on the existing data center agenda and new construction? Sure. So or modular second tier prefabs. When I say new construction, I consider that part of it. So there's pure new construction and I would say new deployment being kind of a fresh data center either through the flexibility. So what's the green right. agenda for those kind of two buckets? So um, so green agenda obviously for, for new data center deployments it's it's much easier, right? I mean if you don't have a PUE of uh, you know one point five or less you're you're doing something wrong of course. But but that's really not I mean most of the case your data centers are going to be 10, 12 even more years old or older, right? And so a lot of times the cost of retrofit becomes prohibitive for efficiency. And again, yeah. Yeah. it's They're it's really power supplies from ten years ago, right? Just killing the power, exactly. But it's it's also really about too what what is the customers what is the business needs, right? Is it availability? Um, but what happens? What starts to happen is when you scale out and you're talking about buying thousands and tens of thousands of servers, right? A little incremental change in efficiency translates to big bottom line savings, right? Um, and whereas an enterprise Give me an example. Um, so if you're looking at like a, a, a Microsoft or something like that, right? Um, so where they're buying tens of thousands of servers at a time. Um, if you're able to lower your, your, your PUE, maybe a, a point or two or something like that where you're talking about multi-megawatt data centers, you're talking about a significant chunk of change when, you, when you're talking about... Not only cost savings, power savings. It's good for the grid, too. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's, there's more power available. It's, it's, it's more... Uh, it's, 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 it's closer to their bottom line, right? They're able, they're able to save more money there. and then. 
also, you know, when we talk about efficiency, we're not just talking about power efficiency, right? There's a, there's a whole motion on deployment efficiency. Um, literally uh, yeah, labor, saving cardboard labor. and boxes, right? Yeah. Of having things pre-integrated, the labor and the planning to deploy these things. There, there's a lot of efficiency there, and so um, green, mm, not so much, but I talk more about efficiency of process and efficiency of deployment as an overall picture. Were you involved in any of the data center announcements? You guys announced the zero, uh, Net zero data Net center. Net zero data center. Mm -hmm. um, you unveiled it, which said cut the power usage by 30%. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in that at all? Um, that was actually more of an HP Labs um, project, um, so I wasn't involved directly. But it relates but to your world, right? But as it relates to efficient data center infrastructure. Was that, was that a fully developed HP Labs product, like to create that shiny example? How real, how real, how close are we to getting to net zero? We're getting very close. I mean, for example, you know, and I keep referring to pods because it's close to my heart, but I mean, we're talking about PUEs of 1.05 um, in a pod, and that's a, that's a redundant, that's redundant infrastructure there, right? I mean, you're talking tier two plus, tier three uh, infrastructure, and you're 1.05. Uh, so we're very close, and I think, again, as, as we start to talk about redundancy through, through replication and through software and things like that, and you start talking about more efficient power systems, you start talking about flywheel UPS systems and you know DC systems mm -hmm. and things like that, you're minimizing conversions and losses, and so I think we're getting very close. And then you start talking about things like chillerless data centers, right? The ASHRAE temperatures keep going up, uh, and obviously we're staying lockstep with those things. So uh, your cooling requirements, which obviously take the most amount of power in your data center, are going to start being d more and more diminished, um, and therefore, um, you know, we are getting close to that, uh, you know, nirvana, which would be a PUE of one, or heaven forbid you put a hamster wheel on it, then you're selling <laughs> power back to the grid, and we're yeah. now negative PUEs, and they're a power generating source. So we're here at the cloud, <laughs> the cloud computing <laughs> conference. Everyone wants to know: is cloud greener? Is it, you know? So what's the? I, I do agree that greener, I mean, green isn't bullshit. It's just not on the agenda. But certainly, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, small advances create great wealth. Uh, savings when you have the small improvements, but right. the question is, is that, is the cloud a greener strategy, uh, is one question, for the data center guys who want to build out and maybe do some, do some pods and modularity. The second question uh, I want you to talk about too is, for people building clouds, we're seeing some hyperscale activity, Capgemini's got a data center, they're learning new things. What would you share advice to those guys as they think about the scale? What can you pass on to them as advice? So first one is, what, is cloud any greener for the data center in terms of a strategy and deployment? And two, what do you, what do you say to the service providers okay. that are building out at scale massive data centers to service the cloud business? So is, is cloud greener? Um, I would say today, not yet, because I don't think people are holistically committing to the cloud, and I still think that they're, they're still going to be running parallel architectures and parallel um, infrastructure for a while. Um, and I think as we you know, look out 2020 and things like that, I think yes, we might, obviously advancements in, in, in server and processor um, efficiencies and things like that will, will lend to that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think long term, it's, it's definitely going to be a, a, um, a more efficient strategy, but today I don't think we're quite there yet until it's tested out and proven. Um, you know, some of the things that I would say to, um, you know, to, to service providers that are looking at scaling out and things like that, you know, definitely, obviously, uh, you know, modularity is close to my heart. So, you know, when you talk about implementing that pay-as-you-grow approach, truly be elastic and be able to use that modularity to, to, uh, to ebb and flow so, with the so, market and customer so needs. So, should they be thinking about that in terms of a facility? What's the cr variables that they need to watch in order to manage the, the modularity? Is it, is it space? Is it like the parking lot? I mean, is it facilities, all of the above? It's, what would you say to them? It's really all of the above. To and, your and two cities? Yeah, so I would, you know, all, I, think, I think all of that. I, I think that, you know, obviously we, we're crossing new horizons and new boundaries, right? So, I mean, I think um, there are definitely some cutting edge and bleeding edge um, ideas and concepts, but we're starting to see that tier two cities, we're starting to see things as, as far as uh, lack of redundancy. Everybody doesn't need 20 minutes of battery backup these days, you know, things like that. And so we're starting to see people paring it down, getting more efficient, more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the thing that I see in, uh, it, on the facility side is, you know, is the overinvestment, oversubscription of uh, first cost investments and, and things like that. Um, and I think what happens is people get locked into something and they're not able to be as agile and as flexible. So, you know, using a model that has a, a smart entrance and exit strategy out of that and be able to scale that model uh, makes sense. And that would be obviously modularity all the way down to the facilities level as much as you can. Okay, well, last question here. We're wrapping up the CUBE conversations for the day. I want to ask you about um, retail data centers um, and wholesale. 
had some retail players out there, the GoDaddies of the world, mm -hmm. selling cloud and doing all this stuff. Right. Essentially, not really cloud, but our data centers. And then you have people get, getting into the wholesale data center. That's a more interesting business. So comment on the, what's going on in your mind, if you can, from the wholesale perspective. On specialists who build out these data centers from scratch and then sell them to vendors. So there's kind of an interesting market developing around that. It is, um, and Can it's- Can you share uh, any information about that and as we to learn more about it? Well, I think, um, you know, some of the events that I've, I've attended, Uptime Symposium and things like that recently, you know, there's that discussion between the, the, uh, the design build guys and the, and, the, and the real estate guys too of, okay, you know, what are we going to do here? Uh, even though we talk about modularity, you know, it, does modularity play within the, you know, the, the, the brick and mortar type model that we've got and how does that work and how does everything interrelate and is it threatening or not threatening? Is this something that, you know, we're going to have to do? We're being pushed to be there. Uh, you know that kind of thing. So I mean, I see that um, I see the hybrid approach for you know wholesale guys, and, and I see them you know designing a a facility that can accommodate you know traditional uh, legacy systems, but also be able to can, um, to look at some of the more cutting edge technologies as we start to see scale and HPC really start to uh, to to increase uh, year over year growth and things like that. They're going to need to plan for that space and be able to accommodate Well, it. you guys at HP have done an amazing job both on HP Labs with Net Zero Data Center. Uh, Net Zero Data Center is a great case study out there. Um, and also Jim Gontier with the Gen 8. Um, you guys are building servers now that are highly cost effective, great management tools. Absolutely. Um, you guys are really leading the way, so congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what your products are. For me, I'm looking for modularity. I want to, I'm looking for to expand that definition to understand more other than the, the pod, the pod's easy to understand. Drop a pod in, turnkey. Right. But I'm interested in, 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 in more of the prefab with kind of the end finishing touches aren't there. So We're working on the HP experience, really. It's all about you know the end-to-end -end experience of a customer comes to us with a problem. We start with a blank piece of paper and we, 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 we're able to plan, design, implement the IT, the facilities, and put a nice service wrapper around it so the customer literally doesn't have to worry about anything we're delivering the Well, keep in solution. touch. We're going to launch a data center angle verticals very shortly. We're tracking DCIM. Okay. We're tracking some of the work you're doing around the modularity. And certainly, we're going to be following. So keep in touch and, and share with us that information. Absolutely. Okay, this you. is the uh, CUBE Conversations from uh, Intel Forecast 2012 in New York City at the Cloud Expo. I'm John Furrier, SiliconAngle.com. Thanks for watching.